So, as his forces wage war in Ukraine, President Vladimir Putin has been leading Victory Day commemorations in Moscow. Thousands of soldiers have been marching through a red square on the day the nation celebrates the surrender of Nazi Germany to Soviet troops in 1945. You can see the Russian president there alongside uh, one of his Russian generals. In Red Square, as the commemorations go on, uh, Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky is saying that Russia's war is repeating the horrors of the past. But President Putin told the crowd in Red Square that his troops are fighting for what he calls the security of their homeland. You're fighting for our people in Donbass, for the safety of our motherland, Russia. May 9, 1945, will forever be perpetuated as a triumph of our one single Soviet people, of its cohesion and spiritual might and perilous exploits, both at the front line and at the home front. The victory day is close and sacred to each one of us. Well, Hoda Abdelhamid is standing by for us in Kyiv, but first let's go to our correspondent Dorsa Jabari, who's in Moscow. And uh, Dorsa, we were listening to uh, President Putin speaking, and interesting perhaps more because of what he didn't talk about. Certainly, Nick. I think uh, there was a lot of expectations here about uh, what the Russian president would say and uh, whether or not he would talk about what the people of Russia can expect in the coming days and weeks ahead. Uh, but Vladimir Putin seemingly keeping his speech very short. And within a minute into that speech, he talked about the justifications for the decision that he made to send in Russian troops into Ukraine on February 24th. I think it's important that he did uh, link what is happening now in Ukraine and what has happened between Russia and NATO, as well as the um, other Western countries, to what he believes to have happened during World War II. He says that they're um, fighting for their um, security and that they believe that they were under threat. He even went so far as to say that he believed that Crimea, which Russia annexed in 2014, was about to be attacked by uh, NATO forces. And uh, that is why they decided to uh, take the action that uh, they did. He said that um, every life that has been lost in Ukraine is a sad loss for the country. And he also said that the families of the victims um, of the Russian soldiers that have died in battle in um, Ukraine will be looked after by the state. He also talked about um, how what he did decide to do was a preemptive rebuff. He said that, um, again, he believed that it was the right decision to do uh, for Russia. And this is certainly a very significant day in this country. It's not only a victory, but it's also something that is very much part of the culture, because Russia, of course, lost nearly 27 million people uh, during World War II. And uh, there is not many Russians you will find or speak to that haven't had a personal connection. Many people have lost family members during World War II. And of course, Vladimir Putin is one of them. And he did say that um, the to the soldiers in Red Square, he said, you are fighting for the same things that your grandfathers were fighting for. So certainly, uh, in evoking very important, powerful imagery uh, within Russian society. But what was missing clearly was what is coming up and what happens next. That is certainly not clear. We've also been seeing footage from Sevastopol that is in Crimea of Victory Day um, parade that is ongoing there as well. And uh, this is something, of course, that is going to carry out throughout the day and across uh, Russia in all the cities in this country. What is the, the Kremlin view of progress that has been made or otherwise during the, the two months and more of this, this so-called special operation? Well, according to the Russian Defense Ministry, and we just saw the Russian Defense Minister alongside uh, Vladimir Putin in Red Square walking with him and speaking to the Russian president, uh, according to the Defense Ministry, they are on track and they are achieving their goals. Now, um, the phase, the first phase of this so-called special military operation ended at the end of March, and now they're into the second phase, which is their focus on um, securing areas in eastern and southern Ukraine. And we also heard from Vladimir Putin saying that the soldiers, uh, some of them have now just returned from the battlefield in Donbass to take part in this parade in Red Square. Uh, there is a sense that, of course, this is now day 75 of this military operation, and it continues 
continues, but there's no clear outline about what they are hoping to achieve in the weeks ahead. Certainly, according to Vladimir Putin and his officials, they are on track and they will achieve all the goals that they set out to do. Uh, but what happens after that is not clear and how long this will take is very uncertain at this time. But it is important that Vladimir Putin has the support of the Russian population, and this day is just about that, to rally support uh, behind this cause. And it's very clear that the narrative coming from the officials here, not just today, but over the past few weeks since February, has been to try and link this country's past with what is happening in the present to uh, get as much support as possible. On February 24th, when Vladimir Putin announced that Russian soldiers would be entering Ukraine, state TV started broadcasting immediately uh, images from the war during World War II, as well as movies that were shown at that time. So there is a sense that this day is part of the larger narrative that is unfolding in Ukraine. All right, Dawson, we'll leave it there for the moment. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, Dawson Jabari there reporting from Moscow as we watch the Seen in Red Square, President Vladimir Putin walking with his military top brass on the 77th anniversary of the Soviet Union's victory over Nazi Germany. Uh, obviously, the backdrop to this is the uh, so-called special operation that's ongoing in Ukraine that's been happening for more than two months now. Let's cross to Ukraine, to the capital, Kyiv. Hoda Abdul Hamid is live for us there. Um, and Hoda, we've just been listening to uh, an excerpt of President Putin and what he had to say. Uh, his words will have been carefully scrutinized there in Ukraine, what will have been the view? Well, certainly I can imagine that everybody from President Zelensky to the chief of staff will be watching, uh, would have listened very carefully. Now, there was all sorts of rumors swirling, uh, really, in the, com in the days leading uh, to today, all sorts of speculations about what could President Putin say during that speech. And I think it fell uh, off the expectations. There was talk that he might declare an all-out war on uh, Ukraine. What we saw there from a Ukrainian point of view is certainly a, a very reserved President Putin. He did start his speech. Um, I did feel that it was reminding us of what he said uh, before the war when he declared this special operation in uh, Ukraine. Uh, but, you know, at a certain point, he is reminding uh, the Russian people about why Victory Day is so important in their history but now there's a war unfolding here in Ukraine and there is no sign of victory. Yes, the Russians at the end of the day could outgun and outnumber the, um, there you see the air siren going on. So the war is still ongoing and certainly he hasn't won over the hearts and minds of the people he said he was uh, going uh, to protect in the name of which this war started. Uh, this is our report. The real toll of this war for Russia, unclaimed body bags stacked in refrigerated trains. Soldiers dead on the front line as Russia claims to rescue the Russian-speaking population living here. Ukraine says about 25,000 have lost their lives so far, but Russia puts that number at about 1,300. We were given rare access to the bodies left behind as Russia retreated from the Kyiv region. He was an elite paratrooper. This jewelry was found on him, allegedly stolen from Ukrainian civilians. Ukraine treats the dead enemies better than how they treated civilians. They will be kept as long as need be. The government will decide because Russia refuses to take them. It doesn't want them. Each body is a proof of a war crime. So if they refuse to take them, Ukraine will bury them at our own cost. The war is in its third month, but so far Moscow has no clear victory to show for it even in predominantly Russian-speaking Mariupol, where it did enjoy some popular support in the past. Now Yevgeny Sosnovsky says those voices are gone. He just came out of the port city two days ago. I was cycling past the destroyed theater building. I noticed that they were clearing the main avenue and the central square. Perhaps they were preparing for this so-called victory parade but I also could still see the blue and yellow of the Ukrainian flag. And vendors are refusing to sell goods in ruble. 
only Ukrainian currency. Evgeny has documented life under occupation as much as he could without getting detected by soldiers. Hardly the image of a liberated people the Kremlin want to portray. After failing to take Kyiv, Russia has concentrated its air power on destroying Ukraine's infrastructure in what it calls a special military operation. But so far, more than 3,000 civilians have lost their lives and the human cost for both sides is rising by the day. Olga is among the millions displaced by the conflict. She's also just made it to safety with her two young children and mother. Before their arrival, life was good. We had a beautiful city, parks, everyone had life plans. Work, freedom of choice of language, freedom of movement, freedom of thoughts. We lived freely. Then Russia came to rescue us. They liberated us from our houses, our jobs, some of their lives, some of their legs or arms. That's the liberation. Olga has now switched to the Ukrainian language with her children. While Russia celebrates its victory against Nazi Germany at the end of World War II, it is now in battle in a war that didn't go as expected. It's a fascinating report, Hoda. It's interesting, isn't it, this kind of tragic irony that both Ukrainian and Russian soldiers fought alongside each other in the war that Victory Day commemorates. Yes, absolutely. And actually, you hear that, more, uh, especially when you speak to elderly people who also have, uh, you know, family history when it comes to World War II. Uh, they were, they are quite flabbergasted, especially in the east of the country where you heard these, that generation kind of always defending Russia. Uh, they were accused of being pro-Russian even until the eve of the, when the war started. Uh, well, that has changed. Maybe the pro-Russian voices are silent at the moment uh, because of the overwhelming anger among Ukrainians. But I think one of the main uh, Points. One of the uh, that came out of this war is this new solidarity among Ukrainians, whether in the west or the east of the country, that was maybe lacking in the days uh, leading uh, to the war. So when it comes to hearts and minds, I would say that at the moment Russia is on uh, losing ground. Now, also militarily, um, there is no clear victory so far. The, as, the, the, the Ukrainian forces, the Azov regiment that is holed up in that steelworks uh, is still holding up a fight, even though on their last legs, according uh, to them. And then everywhere else, wherever Russia arrives, this war that's unfolding in the east or in the south of the country, wherever Russia arrives, it arrives after a considerable amount of destruction. People losing their homes, people losing their villages, uh, schools attacked, uh, all sorts of targets being hit. Uh, so all of that is coming at a huge cost uh, for Russia, which is also losing uh, its own people on the battlefield. And according to the Ukrainians, about 25,000 soldiers. Russian puts that number much lower, around 13 to 1,500. But it's certainly a huge cost. And at the moment, when you're here on the ground, you can't see where it's going to end. Russia wants to take territory, wants to impose its own people on that territory but it will come at an extremely high cost for both countries. Hoda, thanks very much indeed for that. Hoda Abdelhamid uh, reporting there from Kyiv in Ukraine. Uh, while we look at pictures from Moscow, where we've been uh, following the 77th anniversary of the Soviet Union's victory over Nazi Germany, Victory Day being commemorated. Uh, we've watched Vladimir Putin and heard from Vladimir Putin too and just seen him uh, at the Alexander Garden of the Kremlin, commemorating falling soldiers, uh, laying a wreath down at the uh, unknown soldier's grave there. Uh, let's bring in Sergei Markov, who is also in Moscow, director of the Institute of Political Studies there, and a former public spokesman for President Putin, joins us now from Moscow. Uh, welcome to the show, Sergei Markov. Uh, it was interesting listening, wasn't it, to Vladimir Putin speaking, because he laid out his reasoning for the special operation, but he didn't throw it forward at all, no mention of, you know, what the objectives are and, and where this might all end. Uh, uh, yes, uh, of course, the uh, main uh, topic of this uh, speech of Vladimir Putin, which has been very much expected from our audience, uh, has been devoted to the special military operation on densification of uh, Ukraine. 
and uh, uh, Vladimir Putin uh, uh, didn't claim mobilization, and Vladimir Putin didn't claim any uh, uh, situation of war against uh, Ukraine, which uh, some of the experts uh, and politicians uh, expected. And uh, uh, same time, my insensis of Vladimir Putin that mm -hmm. this war had been inevitable mm -hmm. because United States and NATO, which is regarded as main uh, Russian enemies now, uh, they are fully uh, denied Russian concern about uh, security, and they uh, created a very uh, military, uh, brutal, and aggressive regime on the Ukrainian territory, which, uh, first of all, include neo Nazis and Bande rights. This was, by the way, uh, is uh, just new words in English uh, language. Well, and, why do you think? Uh, why do you think the president didn't throw? Uh, this forward, you know, sort of lay out more about the objectives of Russia and Ukraine. Is it because he would find it hard to explain to Russians why they actually need to go to fight and die in a war that Russia is allegedly winning? Uh, it's not uh, so. First of all, uh, uh, Vladimir Putin is a former secret agent of Russian intelligence service, Soviet intelligence service, KGB. And uh, he, uh, doing uh, uh, politics, main decision in his politics uh, in the style of uh, special operation, uh, keeping uh, all uh, goals uh, as secret. And according to the uh, uh, ancient uh, Chinese theory of war, if uh, your enemy doesn't uh, know what is your real uh, uh, goals, uh, aims, it's uh, your uh, part of your benefits. So right. it's uh, mostly important. OK. Uh, Mr Putin said, as you've just been talking about, that Russia's hand was forced by the, the posturing and the threatening behaviour of the West. But in fact, isn't it the case that this so-called special operation has coalesced the EU, it's coalesced NATO and the United States, and indeed NATO now looks set to expand rather than contract because of this. It's actually had the opposite effect. Uh, uh, in Russia, uh, it's uh, Vladimir, Putin, Vladimir Putin. We regard that uh, Ukrainian army doesn't exist as army of Ukrainian people, and Ukrainian people doesn't exist on President uh, Vladimir Zelensky because he's just puppet and the head of the United States and uh, Great Britain. And same time, uh, Ukrainian army fully devoted to the American and British uh, military advices and uh, uh, political uh, political advices. Uh, so it's proxy army of the United States and Great Britain and uh, NATO. It's not Ukrainian army, in fact. You said on March the 3rd that this war will end, so March 3rd, so two months ago, more than two months ago, this war will end after Russia liberates two-thirds of Ukrainian territory from the neo-Nazi repressive regime and a new government will be formed. That was March the 3rd, your words. It hasn't gone the way you anticipated two months ago, has it? Uh, it's uh, absolutely clear that uh, first uh, Russian strategy uh, has been not successful. Russian strategy was uh, uh, to, uh, to come to the biggest cities, Kiev and Kharkov, and then uh, expectedly uh, Ukrainian uh, authorities will leave those cities and will be back on of power will be taken by a pro-Russian politician, but it's not appeared to be. Also, Ukrainian army appeared to be, which is proxy army of the United States, uh, much more strong. Uh, than uh, Russian uh, analysis uh, uh, expected. So this war appeared to be much more difficult and bloody than uh, we expected. Now, uh, 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 we expected that uh, this will be uh, battle for uh, Donbass will continue uh, probably to the, until the uh, middle of uh, summer, and then uh, based on the result of this battle on Donbass, uh, new political decisions uh, uh, will be made. But uh, now those uh, predictions, which is uh, uh, reflected, the plans of Russian authorities, which I get, uh, appear to be not valid. Okay. Now we should think about new uh, analysis of uh, what is uh, will happening. Oh, I'm an honest uh, so, analyst. So, so, if I'm wrong, so again, Markov, uh, we'll have, speaking, we'll so have to I leave it there. Wrong. I'm sorry, we've just run out of time. I do appreciate your perspective on this. Thank you very much indeed for joining us here on Al Jazeera. Thank you.